Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello, welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Liz Hughes. Thanks for coming on the show, Liz. Thank you very much, James, for having me. Do you want to introduce yourself and your role with Physician Associates? I'm a Deputy Medical Director of Health Education England, and I uh, am the Senior Clinical Lead for the National PA Programme for Health Education England. I wanted to get you on to talk about the Physician Associate Apprenticeship model that is being developed. Could you start by explaining a little bit about the idea and and what's going on? Um, The Physician Associate Apprenticeship is one of many roles which is being developed by employers. Apprenticeships have been available for many years and have been increasingly developing within the healthcare professions. And as of now, most uh, healthcare roles uh, have an apprenticeship standard already in place or are in the process of developing one. And the physician's associate, one is in development, but almost at the end of that development. The development of apprenticeships uh, are facilitated by employers. And we in Health Education England, together with um, Skills for Health, and the Institute for Apprenticeship Technical Education help and support these employers to develop uh, the occupational standards that you need for the particular apprenticeship role. So the Physician's Associate Apprenticeship has been developed by a group of employers in the North who are very keen uh, to ensure that they increase the diversity of uh, entrance to the PA profession. Once the standard is approved by the Institute, then that standard is available for any employer to undertake. But this initial group of employers, who are called the Trailblazer Group, as are any group of employers who develop the standard, um, have undertaken all of the work um, to date. Now, obviously, Uh, Physician associates, together with anaesthesia associates, are in the process of uh, becoming regulated by the General Medical Council. And so the standards for inclusion on the register of a regulated professional will be set by the General Medical Council. And they will oversee those higher education institutes that offer uh, PA courses. So, in fact, um, the, the occupational standard for the Physician Associate Apprenticeship is identical to any course that is undertaken by an accredited uh, HEI and will lead to registration on the GMC register for Physicians Associates. So what I would say is it is the same education, but with different delivery. And what's the delivery? Well, the delivery is that instead of being uh, a full-time student um, at a university, the trainee physician associate Uh, apprentice will be employed by an employer in a trust and will be working in the trust and studying at the same time. Their study will be at the same university that uh, a traditional physician associate um, student uh, undertakes their studies. They will undertake all of the same assessments, the same exams, including the national licensing exam, and they will have the same competencies uh, when they graduate. And that when they graduate, uh, given that the regulation we hope will come into play in 2023, they will become um, a regulated healthcare professional. As we know, over the uh, last uh, few years, the number of universities offering PA courses has expanded massively from the initial two or three. And so we are graduating substantial numbers of PAs per year, and they are going into practice in primary care, in secondary care, other um, settings. But we know that we could increase the diversity of entrance to the profession by supporting different routes of entry. By doing it this way, physician associate apprenticeship can earn while they learn. And we can also help to target individuals in particular areas that have workforce challenges and support these individuals into this new uh, way of uh, entering the PA profession. Thanks for explaining that, Liz. It's really interesting to just get an overview of what the plans are. So the idea is the PA apprentice will be employed, paid a wage whilst they study 
the master's PA course at a university. There's also a work element in the apprenticeship as well, isn't there, that the apprentice will have to complete? Yeah, so as in any apprenticeship, they will also work in practice. Now, in essence, this will be a a way of working within a trust that will help and support their development as physician associates. The idea is that that work time will be um, utilised to support your learning and development. And so in actual fact, you may get more, it's likely you'll get more clinical placement time than perhaps you would get in a traditional PA course. And actually, I think you will learn much earlier on about team working, about communication, for example, um, you will, uh, and leadership. So I think this has additional benefits, as well as in providing uh, increased diversity of entrance and widening access into the profession. And that will, I guess, extend the length of training beyond the traditional two years that it takes most PA students to qualify? It may do. It will depend what the occupational standard uh, is developed to and what it's approved by the Institute. The Institute will set out the standard, including the proposed length of time that it will take to complete a PA apprenticeship. It will depend then on how that university course is actually delivered. Uh, Many of the courses are different. Uh, Some of them have uh, a first year, which is all theory. Um, Many of them are integrated. Increasingly post-pandemic, many of them are employing uh, remote learning uh, opportunities. And so that um, may, in fact, uh, help in order to support the learning, particularly of these PA apprenticeships, and allow them to complete the course in perhaps the same time as the traditional entry uh, of a PA student. Brilliant, thank you. So from a student's point of view, this sounds fantastic. You'll earn a wage whilst you're studying and come out through the university process with the same qualification um, as a traditional entry route. What's in it for the trusts to do it this way? The advantages to trusts are a number First of all, all trusts have to pay an apprenticeship levy, which if they don't utilise it, the resource is transferred to someone else. So in this way, they can use that levy to support a PA apprentice, and that levy is uh, is utilised to pay uh, the tuition fees at the uh, HEI for the PA apprenticeship. Now, also, in areas where they are highly challenged for healthcare professional workforce, it enables those employers to directly employ these PA apprentices. And of course, they will then be with that trust, or one would hope, a post-graduation. And you start to build and grow your own workforce. And that's particularly important in, in highly workforce-challenged areas, of which there are a number across um, England So it means you grow your own. It means you take from the local population to train uh, for your own workforce. And it makes a much more sustainable workforce. And I can definitely see the advantages for people who perhaps wouldn't be able to afford to go to university and do the master's self-funding. This is a route that they could access and, like you say, would perhaps recruit from a more diverse background of people that can come in to join the workforce. Absolutely. I think we've got a great opportunity here, you know, for for people to attract a a much wider uh, of people who will undertake PA training, who will reflect the local community and its diversity. Also, I think, you know, the real sustainability of this route um, is important. And if you, as the PA enjoys their Um, their training, the likelihood is they're going to stay with that trust, particularly um, if they can see uh, development opportunities as a PA. And we, you know, part of what we've been doing nationally is on the career and core capabilities framework to help and support um, employers develop that career pathway for a PA. But also it's likely that, you know, they will act as their own ambassadors for people to, you know, come and train within that organisation. And I think, you know, we know that workforce is a challenge. You know, this is this is not, the, you know, the silver bullet to, to sort everything out, but it, it does give us another opportunity, another 
entry point for employers to support their workforce in a sustainable way. One of the questions that I think people might have about this scheme is around the entry requirements to get onto the apprenticeship. Is there anything you can say about whether that will be different to the traditional PA course? For the entry uh, entry criteria, we are suggesting that employers interview the, the PAs together with their HEI colleagues, because it's important that the student PA is able to complete academically the, the course. However, it does give people the opportunity to look at a much more broader portfolio of admissions uh, with their um, selected uh, university. So looking at perhaps uh, BTEC, um, T-levels, for example, uh, and looking at a much wider, wider uh, range of portfolios. And we know that, for example, this already happens um, in some universities. We know that UCLan, for example, uses a um, a very wide portfolio entrance, particularly for um, uh, combat medical technicians who are leaving the forces to retrain as PAs. So I think it's a great opportunity, again, to take differing academic qualifications to come into this profession than perhaps the one, the, the more traditional route has been in the past. Interesting that you mentioned the combat medical colleagues with the roots of the PA profession in America being out of Duke University in the 60s, where they were hoovering up these combat medical people with lots of skills and then had to put them through the PA course uh, to use them. It's sort of coming full circle. Well, it is. And I mean, we know the PA, that's how the PA started, the role started in the States. And, you know, I think we have a, a huge amount, again, of really high level um, experience um, in, in these um, individuals. And uh, traditionally, when they've come out, that experience has been failed to be recognised. And so they've gone into other jobs where they haven't utilised those skills. And yet we know how important those skills have been in deployment. And, and we, we need to conserve those skills and support those people as one group who could go in through this particular route. Do you envisage that the need for an undergraduate degree in a bioscience or healthcare related field will be different on the apprentice entry requirements compared to as it has been for the traditional route? I think the entry criteria has to be a joint discussion between the employer and the HEI because it will depend very much on the individual HEI because it will depend on the individual HEI and what they feel able to accept as, as entry qualifications. And some of them, as we know, are much more flexible in, in their approach to this than others. We know that there are HEIs proposing direct entry PA course, courses now without the need to do a first degree. So again, it's really, I think, it's making the entry points into the profession as diverse as we can do. It's not just one way in. We need to be looking at different ways in so that, you know, we can get as many people into this role, which is a new, you know, essentially a new role. So it's a new workforce and we can be taking from a different population of people to support the workforce instead of always perhaps you know, taking from other uh, healthcare professions. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Liz. It's got my mind worrying about all these questions and how it's going to work in reality. How are you going to ensure that the apprenticeship isn't seen as a second class version of a PA? How are you going to assure that the quality of the PAs is still as high as it ever has been? So I think it's really important that this uh, is not perceived as a second class training to be a PA. In fact, I think we may find that this will turn out to actually give PA apprentices uh, even more experience than if they uh, they actually came in through the traditional route. The first thing is that actually a, an apprentice of any sort is under the uh, auspices of Ofsted. And if you are an apprentice supervisor, as I've been in the past, and there is a very stringent method of supervision and reporting that's undertaken. Uh, and it, so the apprentice is kept ex under extremely close supervision. So I think that we'll be able to say that uh, from the practical point of view, they will be gaining their competences and that will be documented. I think from the uh, academic point of view, they'll be doing exactly the same masters, they'll be doing the same assignments, the same exams, the same assessments. So 
as I've said before, it's the same education, just with um, a different delivery. And so I think we may find that people undertaking this route will actually find that the additional um, on, uh, on work experience they get will help them um, much more in their PA course than perhaps might be perceived at this point in time. So I think we need to understand there is nothing different uh, in the training academically of of a PA uh, apprentice than there is of a a traditional uh, master's PA student. And in fact, uh, we may find that they actually gain additional experience um, in this uh, in this particular route. So the PA apprentice will still be doing the same level of education, the same level of assessments, the same exams, the same criteria to fulfil to pass their master's level PA course as a traditional PA student. They'll just be being funded and recruited from slightly different areas. They'll still be taking the national exam to get on the PA register at the moment. With GMC regulation, it will still be the same level of quality assurance that the apprentices are doing the same as the traditional students. Is that right? Absolutely. And and, and it has to, because with a regulated profession, they, they will have to achieve those outcomes as defined by the GMC in order to get onto the General Medical Council PA um, register. Thank you. I've got two more questions in my head at the moment. One of the, I guess, stumbling blocks I can see in my mind is this might be quite difficult for the universities, the HEIs, to set up a course. Are they going to have to run an entirely separate apprentice course and then a master's traditional course? Is that going to be difficult for the HEIs to achieve that? I think this will depend uh, on the HEI and the flexibility of their courses. Uh, Many HEIs um, now uh, run uh, different courses, different blends of remote and face-to-face teaching. I think this will provide an opportunity to utilise all of those different strands of teaching uh, to deliver um, the PA apprenticeship. And I think there are a number of uh, HEIs who are already actively thinking about how they will deliver this course and are entirely committed Uh, to flexibility within their current course. Now, there's no demand that every HEI that currently delivers a a traditional PA course has to uh, offer that for PA apprenticeships. But uh, there will doubtless be a number of uh, HEIs who are uh, known to be very innovative and looking towards particularly supporting uh, healthcare workforce shortages in their area Thank you. And I think you alluded to this sort of at the beginning of what we were talking about. The apprenticeship model is not an exclusively new thing that is being thought about just for PAs. This is going across the board in healthcare education, isn't it? And there is even a doctor medical apprenticeship model being thought of as well. Yeah. So apprenticeships as a way of increasing access to healthcare professions. And we have uh, occupational standards for apprenticeships across the majority um, of healthcare professions, as indeed with many other professions. And in fact, we have just submitted the standard for a medical degree apprenticeship, i.e. training as a doctor uh, by an apprenticeship. Again, same uh, education, same outcomes for general medical counsel, just a different delivery. And at the same time, HE is also commissioned um, a blended learning medical degree which will um, allow remote learning uh, with some face-to-face. That could be utilised to support, for example, medical doctor degree apprenticeship. So we've got lots of innovation that go along with this apprenticeship, and we really need to embrace all types of apprenticeship as uh, another way of helping to support the NHS with badly needed um, additional workforce. I think that might be of interest to physician associates who've qualified and worked a little while to hear about the opportunity to perhaps go on and do an apprenticeship as a doctor or another profession. Absolutely. I think that's another, you know, another route that I'm looking at um, to try and help and support. You know, there's lots of there's lots and lots of opportunities, really. Obviously, this is all at the sort of planning and consultation stage at the moment. How soon do you see this coming in and 
being an offer that people can sign up for? So the development of the PA apprenticeship is well underway. Uh, the Trailblazer Group has been in uh, in existence for um, over a year. The occupational standard will be submitted in early 2022. Obviously, with the, the GMC now regulating the profession, we are making sure that we work with them to make sure that everything is in order, as we have done with the um, medical doctor um, degree apprenticeship. But we would hope that the standard might w- might well be approved by mid to late 2022. And for anybody who's listening to this, thinking that they might be interested or they know somebody that would benefit from the PA apprenticeship model, where would you point people to go to at the moment to find out more information? The people that need further information, the Institute um, of Apprentices and Technical Education has a very good website which identifies which standards are in development and potential projected uh, timelines. But if people are interested, then we uh, have a team within HEE that's working on this, which um, uh, of which I'm a member, and uh, also Jane Hadfield, who is our apprenticeship leader as well. And we'd be very happy to hear from anybody. Brilliant. Thank you, Liz, for coming on the podcast. It's been my pleasure, James. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you for listening as well. I hope you found that a really interesting conversation about the future of physician associate apprenticeships. If you've got any ideas for future episodes of the podcast, or you'd like to get in touch with me, I'm on social media at PA Podcast UK. It'd be great to hear from you and get you on the show as well to talk about what you're doing as a physician associate. And I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Physician Associate Podcast.